The following interview was conducted with Robert Heichert for the Purdue University Libraries. It took place on May 29, 2014 at Smalley Hall in the Vice President's Conference Room. The interviewer is Renee Gorder. Thank you for being so willing to help us with this project. Happy to be here. The first thing that I have to ask is when did you first come to Purdue and what brought you here? It was September 3rd, 1966. Um, it was a typical hot summer day in St. Louis. I got up, packed all of my clothes and half of my books in the car, and my dad and I drove here um, across Illinois and up 231, and I checked in at Cary Hall. I was a brand new graduate student in a brand new American Studies program here at Purdue. And that's basically why I came. But I was also going to be a counselor in Cary that year. And that's how I got started. I, I noticed you did quite a bit of, of work here at Purdue. American Studies and then Medieval History, right? Yes, and some work in restaurant hotel. Um, I probably should have three master's degrees, <laughs> but don't have any because I never did a thesis. Mm -hmm. But I did a lot of coursework. Yeah. Had a lot of fun learning. I just wasn't truly motivated, I guess, to go through all the hurdles. And so I just kept going on and on and on. So um, you, from your CV, you've been responsible for many residence halls, including, tell me if I'm correct, Owen, Wiley, um, and Carrie, plus some of the um, Plus Terry Courts. Terry yeah. Courts, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so in what ways were these halls similar to one another and what ways were they different? Well, uh, Terry Courts was probably the most different. Uh, they were all residence halls. Terry Courts was a small group living environment, 36 buildings of 14 to 20 students each, whereas the other halls were all larger operations and typically corridors that had uh, 40 to 50 people on them with common washrooms. So it was more a matter of, of scope, uh, but the residence hall is the residence hall at Purdue. Uh, the same fundamental mission, the same principles apply, and uh, group living is group living. If you're, you know, student life is, it has common elements. It doesn't matter whether you're living off campus or in a residence hall, excuse me, <clears throat> or in a residence hall, you still have physical needs that have to be met. You still have academic needs that you need the opportunity to meet in, in your environment. But it's a matter of how those play out. And if you're living off campus, generally it's an individualistic approach to living. Uh, in a residence hall, it's a group environment. It's about community. And uh, yes, all of our residents are individuals, but in the residence hall, they are always in a group context. And there has to be a group consciousness. So the student has to learn to think, how does what I do affect other people who live around me? Whereas in a private apartment off campus, or even in a house with a group of two or three others, uh, the outlook and the attitude is, is much more individualistic. So in that very uh, philosophical way, uh, it doesn't matter which residence hall a student lives in, they have the same kind of a context and the same kind of a lifestyle, if you will, that they have to adapt to. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so right now you are the Director of Administration for Housing and Food Services, right? Correct. Uh -huh. So what, what are your duties encompass? Well, let me say what they have accomplished, or have encompassed the last nine years. Uh, last April I turned those responsibilities over to another person, and right now, or since then, my whole responsibility has been writing a book. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, Basically, that position has at its core the directorship of all of the application, contracting, and assignment processes for the system uh, in terms of getting all the 12,000 students that we house 
uh, placed and accommodated. Uh, but in addition to that, it also bears the responsibility for being the liaison with a number of other departments. Uh, the bursar, the registrar, financial aid, registrar, uh, intercollegiate athletics, uh, U.S. and campus mail, and several others, uh, and working with those particular departments uh, to facilitate whatever they need from us in the way of information and whatever we need from them in the way of support to make the life for our residents work well. Um, it also has the responsibility for the budget process for the residence halls as a whole and uh, for setting rates and adjusting those as needed through the course of any given period of time and also then keeping statistics on the various aspects of housing and providing that information to people who need it whether those are university personnel or the U.S. Census. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so that's, that's a pretty long list, a hefty list of responsibilities. What have you found most challenging and then also most rewarding with um, all of your positions at Purdue? I think, well, let's go back. I, I've held basically three positions. Mm -hmm. The same position a number of times mm -hmm. as a manager, but I've been an assistant manager. I won't talk about the counseling position. That was kind of a separate entity. But as a full-time administrative position, I've been an assistant manager, a manager, and then the director for administration. Uh, as an assistant manager, my job was basically to learn to be a manager mm -hmm. and to help the manager with the residential life function. And I, I think the biggest challenge in that particular position was just learning everything you really needed to know to be a good manager. It's just amazing what uh, a full and complicated debt position is when you get below the surface. In one way you can describe it fairly simply, but it really isn't that simple. So the biggest challenge was really, as a brand new young administrative staff member, coming to grips with the wide variety of things I was having to learn in an awful hurry, and trying to live up to the expectations that the people that hired me had, uh, both Bob Page, the director, and Bob Hunt, my manager. Uh, I guess they saw something in me, and they had great expectations for me and I didn't want to let them down. Uh, as a manager, uh, the biggest challenge is um, balance. Um, I, I think as a manager you have to keep in mind that in the residence halls our purpose and our function are different. Mm -hmm. Um, some people think it's just the one or the other, but it's not, it's really both. Uh, our function is to provide a quality level of housing and food service at a reasonable rate okay. and to make sure that that service works well and is comfortable for the residents to live in and creates an environment in which they can be academically successful. On the other hand, our purpose is the education of residents through the experience of group living. And so as a manager, you have to realize, first of all, that you have to balance the function and the purpose mm -hmm. and keep them working together. Uh, as R.B. Stewart said when he first started building the residence halls with carry east unless there is an educational purpose to what we do in the residence halls there is no reason for the university to be in the business mm -hmm. so that's always the prime directive now it has it was his vision and has been ours continuously 
that fundamentally that educational purpose involves development of leadership and character as opposed to academic, uh, an academic role which the faculty and the other administrators on campus provide. Um, so you have to keep those two things in balance because first of all you can't separate residence life from the physical context in which it exists. Mm -hmm. The physical context has to be viable for the residential life aspect to work well. So when you look at then the function that we have to carry out, the manager's job and biggest challenge is to continually balance uh, the often um, complementary but sometimes conflicting needs of food service, um, maintenance and housekeeping, residential life, finances, business operation, uh, and all of the other things, you know, along with residential life that your staff is helping you provide. And so the manager has to be the decision maker. Uh, when those things come in conflict and figure out how we're going to work through whatever the particular issue is at the time. Uh, he also has to keep the balance between the hall and the system. The system has its parameters that have to be respected. So the manager has to constantly represent the system and its needs and parameters to his staff at the hall level and help them understand why they have to do things or why they have to do them a certain way. At the same time, he has to represent the unique needs of his particular operation to the system mm -hmm. and sometimes uh, require an exception on the part of the system. And I found that particularly true <laughs> when I was managing Terry Courts uh, because of the difference in style. Mm -hmm. um, but in addition to those balances then, if you look over on the residential life side, you are constantly as a manager balancing the needs of the group and the individual. And sometimes you have to assert the needs of the individual with the group and sometimes you have to assert the needs of the group with the individual. Uh, so that, that constant balancing act uh, which takes the manager into a wide variety of, of skills and that's why I said this job or that particular job is more complicated than it seems. And I, I, I think um, there are some of those skills that the manager will possess to greater degree than others, but he has to find ways to supplement the ones where he's weaker mm -hmm. and keep the balance because he's the person responsible. And that was another one of R.B. Stewart's great principles. Uh, no man can serve two masters. So he believed that in this operation, where all that balance had to be taken care of. There should be one person who could make decisions and to whom people, including residents, could go mm -hmm. if they needed an answer or a decision and get it. And uh, we've operated that way for many, many years. We have now, in the last couple of years, changed that structure so it's a little different. But for all 31 years where I was a manager, mm -hmm. that was the case and that was the biggest challenge of the job. Um, the fun part of it was that you made a difference. Uh, first of all, that you had a purpose, not just a job. Mm -hmm. But secondly, that you made a difference. You were dealing with real life every day. And uh, uh, you know, you couldn't always see the difference, but you knew you were making it. 
sometimes you could see it, and that felt pretty good. <laughs> Thank you. So, in your opinion, how have the residence halls changed over time? Well, there's a number of ways. Um, let me start with um, how the university has changed, I think, because that has some impact. Mm -hmm. um, I think, first of all, the university has changed in its size. Uh, in 1966, if I remember right, it was a little less than 24,000. Now we're at 40. Uh, the sheer growth has made a difference over time in the size of the residence halls. Uh, we don't house all students, but we have grown as the university has grown. And that has made some difference. Uh, the university has grown in terms of its scope, its number of departments. There are a lot of things that we didn't used to have to have that we have now. Uh, and those all interact and, and make a difference. Um, but I, I think also the university's focus has changed some. Um, I think it uh, when, I, when I first came, one of the things I heard often that the university was most proud of was that it had more practicing engineers out in the world building infrastructure, creating things, doing things, graduated from Purdue than any other university in the world. I haven't heard that for a fair number of years. Uh, but there was a, a very strong emphasis on the very original and fundamental land-grant service function of the university. Uh, that's still there, but the focus has shifted and more emphasis has been placed on frontline research and the development of new knowledge uh, within various fields I won't say completely for its own sake, but there's been a, a shifted emphasis in that direction. And uh, along with that then has been a shift in focus, I think, from my own perspective, from the common student in the state to the exceptional student from anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, that makes a big difference. Uh, and it gets reflected um, in some other ways, too. Um, not only has the university student population grown, but its composition has shifted. Uh, a much higher percentage of out-of-state students than there used to be. And in 1966, there probably would have been only about 200 international students mm -hmm. at Purdue. And now they are, what, 20% of the university student population. That makes a huge difference to us. So uh, I, I think the university focus on its leadership has also changed from development inside to recruiting from outside. And I think you see that most in what's happened um, with the last several executive vice president and treasurers. Uh, the executive vice president and treasurer from the day of R.B. Stewart on through uh, Ken Burns was the bridge between presidents and the link in the institutional memory and loyalty and those people were developed and groomed within the university. So um, Lytle Freehafer was groomed under R.B. Stewart. Fred Ford was groomed under Lytle Freehafer. Ken Burns was groomed under Fred Ford. But when Dr. Jiske came and Ken Burns retired, Dr. Jiske went outside and hired Morgan Olson. And then Franz Cordova hired Al Diaz and now we've hired another person from outside. 
And in doing that, we've lost a lot of institutional memory. Mm -hmm. And I think, in one sense, some institutional loyalty, if you will. Um, and, and that makes a difference. Uh, because all these years we have worked under the executive vice president and treasurer here in the residence hall. Anyway, with that as a background, let me say that um, I don't want to leave any of these out. When, when R.B. Stewart started the residence halls with Kerry East in 1928, he established a set of principles that held as we evolved Cary uh, and the first three buildings of Windsor, things were interrupted during World War II when the university became a different kind of place momentarily. Mm -hmm. And that all kind of stopped. The university residences were used differently during the war. But after World War II, uh, we reestablished those. RB was still here, and he had hired a young guy just out of the service named Jack Smalley, mm -hmm. after whom this building is named, who grew into uh, the position that ultimately became Vice President for Housing and Food Service. And under his leadership, and the leadership of the people that he brought in, all of these principles were reestablished. And to begin with, they were, as I've already mentioned, the educational mission of the halls. Um, secondly, that the business operation had to be successful first in order to maintain the program. Therefore, it should be under the vice president and treasurer's authority as long as he was responsible for making it viable he ought to be in charge of it. Uh, then thirdly, that it should be self-supporting. Um, that is, we're not trying to house all students. Uh, and so the university shouldn't be giving us money from all students' fees to support just some. We needed to be able to support ourselves from our income. And that's been true historically and mm -hmm. still is. Uh, but also then that we shouldn't be paying for other students to live elsewhere mm -hmm. or for other purposes. We ought to be distinct. And then that the manager should be responsible for the total operation, including residence life. Um, at this point in time, all of those principles have been modified. Uh, we are in the process now of being shifted away from the vice president and treasurer's office to the provost's office. What practical meaning that will have, we don't know yet. Only time will tell. We'll see. Uh, but that's been changed. Um, the fact that we should get no support from the university uh, general fees has remained true. However, there has been a period of time, several years, where we were required to contribute almost a million dollars a year towards general student scholarships, which in effect wound up being a tax on residence hall students for scholarships for the general student population. Uh, you know, President Daniels has changed that now, but that was a case where the principle had been adjusted. Um, the um, manager being responsible for residence life has been shifted. And over the past five years, we have changed from our traditional manager system to a different one in which all residence life reports to the director of residential life and not through operational managers. So time will tell how well that works. Um, 
The other thing is that in relation to the educational mission, whereas traditionally we have been about to, you know, helping students grow and developing character and developing leadership, uh, but not having an academic role, having the hall support academic success, uh, but being separate from campus. We are now, or have been, in the process of bringing academic life into the halls, starting with learning communities and their growth, mm -hmm. but now in lots of other ways with um, uh, guest live-in faculty members, classes in the halls, and a number of other things, and that's the new mode. Again, we'll see how that works, only time will tell, uh, but it is very different from what we have done. Um, so um, one of the reasons I'm writing the book, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, to capture the age when all of that was true so that the memory of it is not lost in the going mm -hmm. to a different mode. And uh, I just don't want the history of what some fantastic people built and operated to be forgotten. So yeah. I'm taking the chance I've been given to preserve it. Um, now, as far as um, the halls, you don't have them unless students live in them, and uh, students have changed too. That was my next question. How have students changed? Um, what I'm going to say, I think, has to do with students as a group. There are always exceptions, mm -hmm. uh, and not just a few sometimes. But um, I, I think in 1966, students came to us expecting things to be different from what they knew at home. Now they come to us expecting it to be just like home. <laughs> uh, in 1966, I think students more dealt with things. Um, now they come to us and they expect not to have to experience inconvenience or discomfort. Uh, I, I think in 1966 students brought what they needed. Now they tend to try to bring their whole life with them. Yes. <laughs> and they have a lot more stuff now than they did mm -hmm. in 1966. Uh, it's amazing how much pressure that puts on the cubic inch capacity of a room. You know? <laughs> uh, I, I think students in 1966, um, they worked for, earned things. Now they tend more to have them or to deserve them. Um, I think um, students in 66 still tended to come from larger families. Now students come mostly as a single child or one of two. Uh, the structure of the family is very different or can be very different now, where it was still fairly traditional in 1966. Um, and I, I, I think when I was uh, a counselor, an RA now, uh, in 1966 in Cary, one of my biggest challenges was finding enough things for the guys to do. They were always wanting to do something and asking Uncle Bob, <laughs> what can we do? Uh, now I think an RA's, one of the RA's biggest tasks is to get them out of their room. Uh, so it just, you know, the, the nature and the focus of students has changed. They are still college students of this particular age group. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, they're still having to go through the same developmental life tasks of this age group that they did in 1966. Mm -hmm. um, 
they, as freshmen, come to us, are still only four years out of eighth grade. Uh, and we deal with that. <laughs> but I, I, I think um, they are now, in quotation marks, smarter, more sophisticated, or, or street savvy, if you will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I also think less socially capable uh, than they were in 1966. Uh, they're less able or willing to work through things to deal with difference or to cope. Um, and so we do in the residence halls a lot more remedial social education mm -hmm. than we used to do. Uh, but it's the nature of the generation and the time and that's part of our job and that's part of our education through the experience of group living, helping people learn how to be able to do that uh, is probably one of the most important things we do before turning them back out to the world. Um, but uh, uh, it's not quite, you know, in, as I went through the years with this, I could see that evolving. I mean, the difference from then to now didn't just happen. It mm -hmm. wasn't that stark. This was something that happened over a period of time. But it's what we're dealing with now. Mm -hmm. Now, this is something that I've, I've wondered. I know I, I did my undergraduate studies at the University of Idaho, mm -hmm. and we were required the first year as a freshman you had to live on campus. Is that, no. does Purdue have that? or No, we yes. never have that. Okay. Uh, Purdue has always left students the option of where they wanted to live, even as freshmen. Uh, they just, they and their parents make that choice. Uh, but that's why also we've had a full year contract and students can't just leave in the middle of the year um, because we have to be able to plan and to, to operate. So students sign a contract with us for a year. Um, if they change their mind the next year, that's fine. They could live elsewhere. But they sign a contract to stay with us for an academic year, and, and they do. But they don't have to. They could live in a fraternity, a sorority, a co-op, a private home. They could live at home. Um, and we've, we've never required that to be elsewhere or, or to be any different. There is some, and there has been for the last couple of years now, talk about establishing a live-in requirement because all of the statistics show that students who live in residence halls on average do better academically than students that do not. Mm -hmm. And there is an even, there is an even been some question as to whether that should not be just freshmen, but freshmen and sophomores. Uh, that's a move that Ohio State has made in the last few years, and they are at that point now where they have phased into having all freshmen and sophomores live in on campus. Um, I don't know whether we'll wind up doing that or not. If we do, we need more halls. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and I guess I won't in this conversation try to argue whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, there are some pluses and there are some minuses to it. There, are, there is also some thought on my part that once you have everybody living in, the average is the average and you're no longer better than the average because you've got everybody. Uh, but be that as it may, if a decision like that is made, uh, we in the residence halls will do our very best to support the university in that philosophy because that's our job. Well, one of the things in just working with the residence halls for a year now, um, the residence halls have historically been a really popular student choice. Yes, we, we normally will house somewhere between 90, 93, 94 percent of the freshman class voluntarily. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's not true of all universities. Like I had mentioned, I, I've been to two other universities and Mm -hmm. When I was a freshman, I lived on campus because I had to. 
and it just it wasn't they weren't as appealing um, as they are here why do you why do you think that they are so popular um, and, and what makes Purdue residences unique from other universities um, I think let's start just with the physical facilities because we have been structured the way we are and because we have had the vision that we have had of how, what we were about we have always taken pride in maintaining our facilities and so they are good clean comfortable places to live in and I think people know that uh, people see that when they come to visit the university parents appreciate it and I think that makes it comfortable for them to start out here at Purdue knowing that that's going to be the case and that they, that's one less thing they have to worry about when they leave their son or their daughter here uh, so I, I think there is some of that going on um, Secondly, we have a history of being conscious of maintaining the living environment that we have and our, our emphasis on our educational purpose um, fosters that. So people know that we care not just about the physical facilities, but the community that lives in them and that we pay attention to it, that we monitor it, that we take care of it. Um, so I, I, I think People in their first year's experience at a major university uh, tend to have a lot of comfort with us, if you will. They know things will be taken care of. And uh, I guess that is most readily uh, exemplified by my experience uh, my first year as associate or as, as director of administration. 2004 in that spring we were facing um, a, an unexpected increase in the number of university mm -hmm. freshmen coming in and so we had to scramble to create some additional space in order to house them we needed about 300 spaces so we were evolving <laughs> just in a hurry and we had three choices uh, we could take a building or two from family housing and convert it. We did that. We could take back over some floors in Young Graduate House that we had given up and already started to strip out so that they could be converted to university offices and we could put them back into service. And we could make an arrangement with a local apartment complex to take over some of their space and run it as a remote operation, you know, according to our standards. So one Friday evening, we had our staff here pull 100 of the 300 plus folders that were going to be left out of space and we called them mm -hmm. and we said here's the situation we're going to be able to house you but we're going to be developing additional space and here are the three options would you please rank those for us one two three okay. nine out of ten said that the remote operation in an apartment complex was not even an option the other 10% placed it third. And the most common reason was the question, who would keep the bathrooms clean? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that said it all. Yeah. You know, why do people want to live with us? Because they know things will get done. Perfect. Um, how do you feel that your role at Purdue has impacted students? I mean, personally or just? Um, personally and as well as, as an entity. Well, I, I think 
Um, let me, in answering that question, speak from my role as a hall manager. Uh, again, uh, I think where we have our greatest impact is the development of students uh, through their experience of living with us. And the manager has the opportunity to be and is expected to be a difference maker at that level. Um, and that was one of the greatest things about that job. For 31 years, I had the privilege of being called by that title, um, knowing not only that I was expected to be a difference maker, but that I was trusted to be. And it's amazing how good that feels <laughs> every day when you get up and go to work and know that that's what you're all about. Um, so I, I think if I look back, um, the greatest impact we have is on the individuals that live with us. We don't always know exactly when and how we're having that impact. But we get enough feedback if we're around long enough like I have been to know that we have that kind of an impact. So it's in the it's in, it's in the growth and the evolution of the individual students, I think, that we have the, the greatest impact and make the greatest difference. Um, as a director, um, in a step more removed, it was simply along certain lines making it possible for other managers to do that same thing. But now that I think about it, even as, even as a manager, that's what I was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, because when you, when you stop to think about it, as I often told people when they asked me what I did, managers don't do a lot of the actual work. I mean, managers don't make many beds. They don't cook many meals or do many dishes or clean many bathrooms. Um, But, you know, they'll sometimes help with those things when you're shorthanded or when you're turning over for conferences. But they don't, you know, it's their staff to do that. And what the manager does is make sure that the hall staff are trained and oriented to what they need to do and what their priorities are. And then the manager does his or her best to keep obstacles out of their way and let them do what they're good at. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess where we as managers make the difference is making sure that other people are able to be good at what they do. And uh, uh, then I think if I look beyond the residence halls, then what we do in that regard uh, helps make it possible for students to be successful and therefore for the university to be successful in its mission. So we talked a little bit about students, how they changed, but what about student traditions or customs? Are there any that you remember that have made an impression on you? Uh, I, I think there's lots of, um, th there are lots of things that could probably f you know, fit that question. Um, it'd be hard to pick out any particular student customs I, I, that have changed. People are still people. <laughs> um, but there are some things that did change. Um, in 1966, men and women weren't very much visiting each other's rooms. Uh, I was part of the first guest hours committee that drafted the very first policy um, that went into place in 1969. Uh, that changed a lot of things. Um, again, it was one of the first things that made it harder to get students out of their rooms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, but 
you know, so that whole <coughs> degree of male female interaction within the halls, both with the growth of guest hours and then the expansion of co ed halls as the number of women at Purdue grew, uh, again, became a new context. And that, that is something surely that changed uh, student behavior and student, uh, student patterns. Um, I think uh, over time, the changes in our food service changed student patterns. Some of those were changing at students' requests. I mean, the, the generations were changing. Uh, as I look back over all the years that I was a manager and had food service in my halls, I could see the students' patterns of eating at home were changing. Mm -hmm. And then they were coming to us expecting changed patterns. And we moved along with that, um, still maintaining certain key principles, but adapting, you know, uh, the kinds of choice that students expected to have. Um, was very different in 1980 than it was in 1966, and it's very different now mm -hmm. than what it was in 1980. Um, and uh, so how they ate, not just how they ate, but how they ate together in the dining room changed. Um, we went from tables of eight to trying to break that down because students didn't want to eat in large groups and then started to shift back to wanting to eat in larger groups again. So it's not simply a change from one thing to another, but sometimes there are cycles mm -hmm. in the students' uh, change in their patterns of life. And uh, um, you know, trying to think if there's any others that, uh, uh, that come to mind. Uh, I think... Um, how students view um, administrative authority has changed over time. Certainly we went through one big change uh, in the late 60s through the 70s. And then there started to be some shift back again. You know, that goes up and down. Um, but again, you know, students are going through the same kind of life patterns now that they were then, if you look at the years that a student's here as an undergraduate, you know, among there, there are four critical issues, life issues among others, that they wind up coping with. Um, they change <coughs> ultimately through the course, some faster than others, from adolescent adult relationships to adult adult relationships. Uh, again, when they come to us, they're only four years out of eighth grade. They think they're more mature than that, but <laughs> fundamentally they're still that age. Uh, and how they relate to adults changes as they grow into, uh, you know, more full-fledged adults themselves. Um, they wind up coming to grips with what their value system is and is that what it's going to be? Um, sure, They're, they wound up having inherited some as they were raised at home, but now they are away from home and they're at an age where they're questioning things and they have to either keep what they've been given, modify it, or take something completely different. Uh, whatever they do, uh, they have to work through that stage, roughly during this time frame. Uh, they have to come to grips with what their gender means to them. You know, what does it mean to be a guy? You know, mm -hmm. uh, they aren't necessarily overly conscious of that growing up through their primary and secondary school years. 
but they start to think about that by the time they're coming to Purdue. And that's, again, something they have, their, their identity is something that they have to evolve into. And then finally, somewhere, certainly by the time they're seniors, they have to start to come to grips with what's my life going to be all about? Mm -hmm. uh, not just what am I going to do for a living, but what's my life about? And uh, those things are the same now as they were in 1966. Um, so a lot of other things, you know, daily life practices, customs, whatever, uh, are in many ways peripheral to that. Mm -hmm. um, and so as I look at the important things, they really haven't changed. The context has changed. And uh, other aspects of the student generations have changed. Mm, but that fundamental life phase is still real. And we still deal with it. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, I'm not sure yeah. whether I got to it. But. Well, and <coughs> sorry, mm -hmm. my allergies are acting up. So in, in the last few minutes that we have, I'd like to talk a little bit about, uh, about the book that you're working on, Outlined in History of the Residence Halls. Mm -hmm. um, how that's going, if there's anything interesting you've discovered, and, and then um, wrap up by having you tell me what ways the residence halls have impacted your life. Um, start with the book quickly. Uh, it's not strictly speaking a history of the residence halls, although there's history okay. in it. And it's not a memoir, although <laughs> there's a lot of personal memory in it. What I decided to do was tell the story of what I consider to be the residence hall's greatest generation, which is the group of directors and managers that I found in place when I came in 1966. And I say the greatest generation because if you look at them, they were all part of Tom Brokaw's greatest generation, the way he defined mm -hmm. it. That group of people that grew through the, um, through the uh, Depression, fought World War II, came back and built the modern America that we know, the modern mobile commercial, industrially capable uh, community that we have nationally. So I'm, I'm thinking of Jack Smalley, Bob Page, Betty Yarnsman, and Bill Berner as directors, um, and then all the managers that were in place whom I worked under and with later as a manager myself. Uh, they built the system, both physically and socially, after World War II. Uh, and then in the period from the late 60s through the early 80s, they took it through a period of tremendous challenge and change and came out the other side with all those principles and values that they espoused intact. And when you think about what happened during that time period, um, not just the Vietnam War and the anti-authority generation, but uh, tremendous inflation to the point where President Nixon imposed wage price freezes in 1971. Uh, you look at Title IX, uh, African-American issues, Latino issues were rising uh, at that point in time. Uh, just a whole host of things that were a challenge to what they were doing, but also to them personally. I mean, I, uh, Tom Pearson, a, a friend of mine who was also a manager, and I were talking and we agree that we probably in our generation didn't fully appreciate how much of a challenge it was for that particular group of people to have 
their values not just declined, but disrespected by a significant segment of the student population. The, the very values <laughs> for which they had literally risked their lives in World War II were thrown aside mm -hmm. by that particular group. Uh, and yet they still faithfully dealt with that group just like every other student that they dealt with. And they kept their values uh, and they didn't respond in a negative way. I was so proud of them for that and particularly as I look back on it and realize what a challenge that was for them each individually. And I could see it to different degrees as I worked with those people more closely. Uh, in some cases than others, people like Bob Hunt, my first manager. You know. um, but uh, I think the book is my telling their story. Who they were, what they built, and how they passed it on. That, that's really what I'm... So it, 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 it really, the core of it is 1966 to 1986 when the last of the group, Bill Page and Bill Berner and Bob Page retired. But it extends back to 1925 uh, when R.B. Stewart was hired and began the process. Um, and it has a few reflections, or will have a few reflections on the changes of the last five years. But fundamentally, I'm telling a story. Um, theirs is a story that's worth remembering and stories aren't stories unless they're told. Mm -hmm. and so I had the opportunity to tell it and I was afraid of that, <laughs> literally. I, I was so concerned because the mere fact that I'm putting it down in writing makes it the story. And therefore I felt a tremendous and overwhelming responsibility to get it right. Um, so I'm working through that, mm -hmm. but uh, it's their story, and, and that's uh, now as far as how my experience in the residence halls has made a difference to me. Um, in effect, it's been my whole work life. Mm -hmm. uh, I um, I never did think, and still don't think, in things of things in terms of accumulated time. Uh, I just, I don't. From day one, whatever I have done has simply been a part of who I am and a, it's just gone on as a part of my daily life. Uh, but as I look back on it, yeah, you know, your students and your counselors come back and say hi, and then they come back and have their spouses with them, then they have their kids with them, and their kids are coming to college. <laughs> and you, you realize that some time has passed. But I, I still never thought of it in that way. So it's just been a part of my life. Um, but I think the choice that I made and the commitment that I made to the organization and its purpose when Bob Page hired me changed I mean, it changed my life. I was going to be a college prof. Um, but this opportunity came up, and I wound up going down the road less traveled by, uh, as Robert Frost would have said. Um, and uh, I've never regretted it. I think it's given me an opportunity to do good. I've gotten everything out of this career that I had wanted to get out of college teaching. The irony is that when I initially decided to do that, I thought, gee, I can get everything I want out of teaching through residence life, and I won't have to fight for tenure and publish. <laughs> and here I am at the end of my career Publishing. trying to publish a book, <laughs> you know, but that's okay. Uh, 
But I, I, it's kept me, I think, young, if you will, constantly working with students of this particular type and age group. Um, it's kept me active and, uh, um, like I say, it's never bothered me in terms of length of time. And when somebody, you know, I, I guess I'll just say that I'm glad that I've been able to live out the commitment all the way to the end of my career at Purdue, just as all the other people did. And when somebody says, you know, how did you wind up staying so long in that career? I just said, well, look at all the people I'm writing about in this book. When I look at their example, how could I have done any less? Um, I think it's just been a part of me. And uh, it's, yeah, it's made a difference. Sometimes that's hard to put into words. Um, it's allowed me to stay in one place and raise my kids. Uh, in a very nice community, in a very diverse setting. Uh, I remember when my one son was in about fifth grade, he had stayed at a friend's house after school, and I went and picked him up. And on the way home, he said, Hey, Dad, I just realized, you know, there were five of us there, and I'm the only one from the United States. One was from Korea, one was from Poland, uh, you know, I, I forget. But he was just realizing that on the way home because they were just his friends. Yeah. And I, I, I think it's really neat to have your kids grow up that way. And uh, working in the residence halls and at Purdue gave me the opportunity to do that. And. Uh, there are other things like that that I guess I could give as examples, but they just um, would repeat the same lesson. That um, Yes, it, it's had an impact, and it's had an impact on my family, but it's been a good one. Well, is there anything else that you would like to add? Um, <coughs> oh, gee, I'm just... Sorry we didn't have a chance to get into some of the personalities <laughs> of the, you know, the the stories about the individual people, but uh, there will be a lot of those in the book. Uh, I guess I would say I came here in many ways fortuitously. Um, when I look back and think of all the things that had to work just right in order for me to have been here, I have to shake my head. Um, I was an undergrad at St. Louis University. I wanted to be in American Studies, but they only had a PhD program. So I applied to other schools. I got into very good programs, but not with an assistantship. So I couldn't afford to go. And then one day, Father Hastings at St. Louis University said, Bob, I just got a brochure from Purdue they're taking only recommendations from department heads. Would you like me to recommend you? I said, sure. They're starting a new program in on the ground floor. I'll give a look at it, you know. And so he did, and I got accepted. I got a quarter-time assistantship. So I looked into the residence halls and got a counselorship there. But I still had to finish at St. Louis University. And I noticed, gosh, you know, I'm going through in three years here. I still need 12 hours. First of all, I have to get all my reading list exams done and my, my three written exams and my oral, but I also need 12 more hours. Mm -hmm. Well, that summer, there were exactly 12 hours that I had prerequisites <laughs> for. Fortunately, they were divided six hours in the six-week session, six hours in the five-week session. I went to Father Bannon, the head of the history department. He made sure that I got in every one. At the end of what, you know, in the, in the spring of my second year, the professor who was teaching Middle Eastern history 
came to me after class and said, Bob, a bunch of professors and I are getting up a two-day seminar this June on Southeast Asia. I think you'd really enjoy it, find it interesting. You know, it's free and you get an hour credit. Why don't you sign up? I'll see you get in. Okay. So I checked with the bookstore where I was working, got two days off at that in June. And I went, and I learned a lot. was glad I did. But as I look back, if I hadn't just out of interest done that and gotten one hour's credit, I'd have been an hour short and would never have been at Purdue. (laughs) So, I mean, all these little things just seemed to work together. Wow. (laughs) Uh, So I, I, I guess it was meant to be that I would be here and that it would make the kind of difference it had. Um, I just hope, looking back on it, that I've been, over the years, as positive an influence um, for the people I was trying to serve um, as uh, it has been for me. I mean, if you're really going to devote yourself to this kind of work, it's got to be a vocation. It burns you out, Mm -hmm. you know. You have to care about what you do, and you have to care about the people you do it for. And I just hope that I've been as positive an influence as I could have been. I hope, looking back, that the um, my educate. I would like my educational emphasis in what I did to be as pervasive as Bill Berners was. I would like my practical care of what I did to have been as thorough as Bob Page's. I would like my caring to have been great as Betty Arnsman and my drive for excellence to have been as great as Jack Smalley's. Uh, And to whatever degree that I managed in my career to approach those lofty goals, and then I'm, I'm, I'm proud and happy to have been here. Well, thank you. That uh, concludes our interview. Good.